Hi, welcome to Real Film Snobs. I'm Angela Yeager. And I'm Brian Michael. Uh, today we, well, you know, I'm not going to say we have a special episode because every episode is special. But this episode we're reviewing all horror films. Ooh. Uh, but not like, you know, slasher horror films. I mean, we got, the, the, Angela won't watch any of the Friday the 13th movies with me. Ever. That's not true. You've seen them? I've seen some of the original, but there's so many. I, don't, I yeah, think I've served a couple of them. Yeah, you I haven't seen all X, 12. Jason X, will you go into space? No. that one is awesome. I think I've watched the first one. Holy that might be it. Really? Other Jason than, X, yeah. I would recommend a stupid movie, and it is really stupid and a lot of fun. But no, actually, we're going to go to little art house films here, and we're going to go see some uh, made by some prestigious uh, filmmakers, uh, such as David Cronenberg um, and Dario Argento and uh, Guillermo del Toro. So there, what do you think of that? We don't have any clips, so it's going to be all talk. First movie we're going to see, uh, we're going to talk about it, is from 1962. It's a horror classic. This is Carnival of Souls, uh, directed by Herc Harvey. And uh, this kind of reminds me a little bit of uh, Night of the Living Dead. It's very low budget. It's black and white. And um, it kind of relies on the tension uh, of what is out there, um, what their protagonist is actually um, being uh, haunted by. And this is after a uh, car wreck. A woman ha finds herself uh, drawn to a mysterious abandoned carnival. Uh, and um, I thought that the, the very beginning we see the car wreck, which was poorly done. I mean, that was pretty funny. We kind of laughed about it there. But from there, she gets a job at a church and um, and then starts seeing these visions being haunted by this the man that we see this white face and then a bunch of different ghouls that are, are along with him. Uh, what is uh, really well known about this film certainly is the cinematography and the look. There's a lot of some really great double focus. There's a lot of great reflections used in this film. And the amazing Oregon score on this mm. film, which almost at times we kind of laughed about it a couple times because it's become such a cliche now at this point in time with the boom. Yeah. yeah. But at the time, it was pretty groundbreaking. Right. And it is well, pretty bone chilling. It works really well. Yeah, yes. and her character is an organ player. She's a church yes. organist. And what's interesting about that is that she um, is not religious. And early on, she's interviewing, you know, she's getting this job that she moves from the town where she had the accident to this other town um, where she gets a job as a church organist. And they kind of mentioned to her, like, you know, you're a really good technical player, but you need to put more spirit into it. And she said, well, I don't need to do that. I don't need to believe in anything to just play. You hired me to play. I'm going to play. But I thought that was very interesting. Her yeah. character is an, uh, this actress, Candace Hillegas. I've never, I've never seen her in anything else. Uh, but she, you know, she plays the character kind of very coldly in a way. It, it kind of sort of makes sense as you start to watch the film and you realize where it's going. But at the beginning, I just thought, what is the deal with this lady? You know, I know she yeah. was in this traumatic, was it because she has like PTSD from the accident or, you know, what's going She's on? She's the only survivor of this hor horrific accident that just, is, right. you know, survives miraculously. Right. Um, which is very interesting there. Um, but yeah, it doesn't, you know, it does some jump scares here and there. But of course, this is, you know, 62 and, you know, the, 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 uh, the 50s and those a lot of films like Cat People and, and stuff like that. So it's I, more I, of know, an atmospheric thriller exactly. than like, it's not what you, you know, there's no blood and guts. It's not, you know, it's no. not a slasher film. It's more of an atmospheric thriller, if anything. It was made on a budget of $33,000. Shout out to one of our uh, crew members, Aaron Marvin, because I was texting with him about this movie as I was watching it because it was filmed in Lawrence, Kansas which is his hometown and oh, really? and in fact it's what the movie is famous for being filmed in Lawrence Kansas not a lot of movies have been but this movie um, you know it mentions when you look up Carnival of Souls because the director Herc Carvey is from there yeah. um, and this is one of those fascinating movies you know it's on Criterion it's considered a classic now a horror classic and it's the only film he ever made he did commercials, he did shorts, mm -hmm. he did experimental movies. The only feature film he ever made in his career was Carnival of Souls. So it's sort of in that category. It's not as good of a movie as like Night of the Hunter, but it's in this weird yeah. category of it's like, one -time filmmaker you know, of kind film. of cult or classic films yeah. that were made by a filmmaker that never made another film again. And despite the fact you can see a lot of skill, you know, despite the low budget aspect of it, a lot of skill on that 33,000, you know, you see it all on the screen. It looks really good. Well, it's definitely one of those films that, you know, yeah, when you look up classic films, it's certainly when you go by genre this is one of those that's always going to be mentioned so you know as a film snob this is a film that we had to eventually get around to seeing it it's been on my list for a really long time so it's really great to be able to see it i do enjoy the film i can you know i can recommend it it's a it's a really cool film um certainly and uh you know if you're a, a 
someone who likes horror films, uh, you know, start working your way back. Or if you're not necessarily, I always enjoy the ones that show less and are more about the tension. Um, right. That's then, kind of built up into something yeah. than something that obviously has someone with a mask. And it's not gory chasing. at all. In fact, I would no. say people that normally would say, oh, I don't like horror movies because they don't like stuff that's really bloody or gory could easily watch this. Tense. It's, not, it's tense a little, a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Tension, but not. Yeah, not the horror Some that you might yeah. think of a modern horror film. So yeah. yeah, and you can find it online. Certainly, I know that um, uh, certainly renting it online or, or being available online, and sometimes um, not of uh, not uh, uh, the, the uh, most legal ways of finding things online. Or some people, you know, people would love movies on YouTube all the time. So sometimes you just catch them on. There I think it's on easy. Criterion though, so it might be. It on is there. on Criterion. It might be on their channel or on other streaming services. Watch yeah. It. That's on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. I know for a fact, because I did a refresh, and I was like, oh, gosh, I need to flip through the movie. Oh, here it was on YouTube. Yeah, but we didn't watch it originally on there, so that's no. important. No, okay. we certainly did not. But, yeah, when it's on Criterion, you always got to have to check it out at least. Well, and that's where the, a lot of the extras, you know, were very interesting to look yeah. at all the, you know, things about the weird history of this movie. So, yeah. A good making of is always, I think it always adds to a, a classic film. Uh, so then we're going to make our way over to Japan. This is a movie called, uh, named Kwaidon. Uh, this is made by Masaki uh, Kobayashi, who's uh, made uh, Samurai Rebellion, a film that Angela and I absolutely loved and adored, and uh, certainly Harry Carey, another film that we also totally really adored. liked. Yeah. And so once we saw there was a, you know, if you watch the show, we love our Japanese films. We just saw there was a Japanese horror film we could watch. Yay! Yay. <laughs> I still want to <laughs> yeah. watch House. Angela's already seen it. We haven't reviewed it on the show. I don't know why. But uh, this one is uh, what uh, Kwaidan stands for, means is ghost stories. So it's actually several different ghost stories uh, told throughout the film. And I'll let Angela break down each one of them because she's more studious than I am. But what I will tell you, children, with this horror movie, woo, with my fingers, is um, you will, uh, this is one of the best looking films I have seen in a very long mm -hmm. time. And what I was so stunning about this, we actually watched this one together, was that it's kind of a stage setup. It's the state, the most elaborate, amazing, beautiful stage you will ever see. And even though I cannot stand it in a CGI heavy, mo uh, heavy movie, Tim Burton's especially, when I can tell that there's a wall and it does not go any further, even though it's supposed to look like it, and it doesn't because it looks terrible, this one, obviously, there's a wall. But what they use for the colors in the background for the night sky or Amazing. eyeballs that they were shown in there or, or an eye for the sun or just the clouds in there were just absolutely breathtaking i say this an awful lot on the show but this is something you could turn the volume off turn this turn it out on its side and just let the film run and just right. be a living piece of art it's just so beautiful and it was gorgeous to watch it on your tv yes. i would love to even see it i mean i was thinking about it this morning as i was doing my notes and i was thinking it would be amazing to see this on the big screen uh, on a really great like yes. blu-ray resolution yes. because the visuals on several particularly uh, the Woman of the Snow, there that which is the second film, yeah. and there's four four short films basically that are ghost stories, uh, and again, sort of like the last one we reviewed, not really scary per se. A couple of them are very creepy. The first one is the Black Hair, which is really cool and a great morality Fantastic lesson more than anything. It's about a swordsman yeah. who leaves his wife to pursue his own wealth, and then discovers, ah, eh, this isn't all it's cracked up to be, and then years later goes back to try to find his missing wife and. Stuff dun, gets dun, weird. Dun. Stuff you know, gets weird. It's kind of like, you know, it was like Creepshow. If Creepshow was really good and artistic, it's like that. It's yeah. Like little vignettes. Yeah, yeah. And The Woman of the Snow, which is the second one, yeah. which is my favorite of this, all the four, is the one that has the amazing visuals. Not only the snow itself with the scenes, the painted yeah. sky, the oh, fields. Yeah. I mean, or just the walking it's like the, art. Oh. It's like a mural. It's, it's like a yeah. moving mural. It's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. Um, and I love the story on that. That's about a man who's like a logger, I guess you could say, in the yeah. forest. And this mysterious woman woman who's based on an ancient Japanese folk character um, comes and uh, tells him if you you've that she decides to spare his life because he's so young and handsome but she says if you ever tell anyone about me all you have to do keep all you have shut. to do is keep your mouth shut basically <laughs> is what she says she says it much more yeah. eloquently but she basically tells yeah. him just never tell anyone oh. you've seen me and I'll let you live and then you'll sure. see what happens mm -hmm. and then um, Hoichi, I think I might be saying that wrong. Chris will tell me later. The Earless, which uh, the title alone. This one is my favorite. This one was your this favorite? Is my oh, favorite interesting. One. Because so this is a, a young monk who's just this amazing guitar player, and so he's brought to um, where the king of the. Um, 
the emperor wants to have him play, and it actually is ended up playing for um, an audience of ghosts. And so, do you not remember that set with the smoke and the soldiers? Oh yeah, that set was also were living amazing. and then not living, and so he can't see it. And so then they they find out that he's playing for these ghosts, and they they're going to take him into the afterworld. So then they try to do their best. The other monks try to do their best to protect him, and it's. So amazing. It's so cool. It's so wicked. But it's just breathtaking. I mean, we just kept going, wow. Look at that. Wow. Yeah, like I mean, every other scene, we were both I, just going, wow, as we were watching the I, I don't mind CGI. I like a lot of CGI heavy films. And I know that it's, sometimes it's, it doesn't hold together as well. But something like this, you know, you, you, know, you have to use a little bit of imagination it's still here, too. But it's just so vibrant mm -hmm. and just so tangible, you know, at times. It was right. just amazing. And just that, that whole audience was incredible. Yeah. Oh, my gosh, incredible. And the last one is In a Cup of Tea, which is probably my least favorite of the four. Uh, it's also yeah. shortest. It just felt slight compared to the other three. Yeah. Um, but it, it was a nice little coda to the end of the film. Interestingly, because of the length of this movie, and it's a little bit long, yeah. um, when it was first released in the U.S., they cut The Woman of the Snow. Of all the ones yeah. to cut, that's the one they, they cut, cut, to, cut which to me, one. which was the most powerful. Yeah, if you yeah. had to cut one, which, of course, I'm never in favor of censoring a movie, but for length purposes, um, that's the one they cut, which is hard to imagine this series without that one in there but another great Just film amazing. from Kobayashi he was a filmmaker who has a lot of movies out there mostly on Criterion yes. Collection so now I'm anxious to try to get oh, more of his films more. Yeah. I know yeah. He's, yeah so he apparently has a trilogy out there that I for, did not write down the name of but it's a trilogy of films all kind of thematically yeah. related so we'll have to check out that one for a future Japanese episode so Okay, so definitely. Well, yeah, we'll do around the world. We've we'll got to go to Japan again. Well, we'll have to go to Japan again <laughs> at some point. Once yeah, we've, we've gotten got around the world, we'll go back to Japan, <laughs> and Chris can help us with our pronunciations, <laughs> keep us in line. Okay, so we'll move on to our next uh, episode, which is The Brood from 1979, directed by David Cronenberg. And I believe this was Cronenberg's first feature film. Am I correct, Brian? I thought you would know that. No, you don't know. Okay. Look at what I was looking at those IMDb. It was like, is that a movie? There's a bunch of shorts. Okay. There's I thought it was things. his first feature, but yeah. maybe I'm wrong. So it's so. about a man who tries to uncover the secret behind his wife's unconventional psychotherapy that she's going through. Um, boy, that's to say the least. So um, now I... I'm a fan of Cronenberg. I like a lot of his films, but I have to say, um, I actually like some a lot of his later work better than his early Most work. Most recent, that, you, yes, it's more dramatic stuff. That's kind of a little more more mainstream. Well, yeah. some. Uh, um, I mean, like Crash is really weird. You know, he yeah. makes some really weird movies that I liked, but this. Okay, let me get to what I didn't like about this movie. So The Brood, number one, I didn't think it was very scary at all. And it's super creepy. Yeah. It is creepy. And, and unlike the couple we just reviewed where we talked about psychological art, this one is very graphic and very gory. So if you don't like gore, I wouldn't watch this. There is a lot of blood, and there is some gore at the end in particular that's just really gross oh, and that's disturbing. Oh, just awesome. You like this oh, movie? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, you know, so this is kind of the beginning of his, you know, the, the kind of career that he had. He did a lot of body horror films. And then later on, he did more, I would say, dr dramas that didn't have some fantastical element. There right. There were some people who did some incredible things, whichever, strange, strange and odd things. But these are the ones that, you know, it started. It starts here with, with The Brood. And, um, oh, Lord, where did we go? Oh, then we have Fast Company, which is the one I hadn't seen. Scanners, Videodrome, and then, of course, um, there's the Dead Zone, The Fly, and possibly Dead Ringers. I haven't seen Dead Ringers yet either. So that's a really interesting piece of work. Now, our, uh, some of those are classics. Some of those are three-star films, but they're all really interesting and, and very kind of meaty. But see, I liked Videodrome better because it had more of a statement to make. Well, this, this one, was, one, he was going through a divorce. So this one's more yeah. about her divorce. And you I can wonder. certainly see that in, in this film. So what but I wrote down here was woman hating. I thought the film was pretty misogynistic. And I guess I shouldn't be surprised. 1979, you could still do that. Well, but it's very much yeah. that theme you see in a lot of horror movies. Um, and the thing, kind of thing, a movie like Carrie, for instance, that Stephen King wrote, um, was trying to kind of show that the the... The flip side of that is that this element of how much feminine power is scary and horrifying because his ex-wife become it becomes this thing in this movie of, or his I guess they're not even ex his wife who's been sheltered away at this place, yeah. you know her power is so great that everyone's horrified by it and Oliver Reed who plays the you know therapist. You know, his whole thing is like, oh, we need to take rep people out of repression, but that turns out to be dangerous. So it seems like it's a very regressive movie in a way. It's a bit of a mixed bag as it compared to those other ones, it's just, which is a little more streamlined. But I, I, I like this one because uh, it is very uh, it is very creepy. I, I don't find her... Well, see, I, I found what her 
I didn't find it that as misogynistic as because I thought that she had a power, but it was just one that was kind of feared. And I thought that that well, for good reason it turns yeah. out. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. Yeah. And then that's what's fantastic. And so then there's there. So years ago, Bravo came out with. Um, uh, 100 uh, 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 scariest scenes in movies. And it didn't necessarily mean that they were the films, but the scary or, or um, interesting f scenes. And this one was one of those. And when at the end, when we see that she has this brood that she kind of controls because there's these murders that are happening, it kind of like, you know, don't look now, the little, little red hood. And so we find that she has this, and then so she gives birth and she pulls the you know, out of its sack with her teeth, and then she cleans it with her tongue, and right then and there, boy, you're going to you're gonna cl uh, clear out half the audience because people just immediately go, no. Whereas I was like, wow, that's fascinating. And um, what an incredibly brave choice because that's where people were like, wow, whether or not you liked about this film, I always thought it was pretty brave and it's pretty incredible to have that. Yeah, it and definitely this, is pretty shocking. But when you watch these other films, you know, these body horror films are just really interesting, um, and I like that um you know and he reminds me a little bit like you know john carpenter he was really in this prime right at this time and he kind of made these cult films that were just weren't quite mainstream though they kind of should be because there was just so much fun or kind of cool or really interesting but they you were can always tell like they're that. done sort of on a lower budget to a certain degree but yeah. with them and we'll also talk about another one here in a little bit is very much a filmmaker of its time you can always tell what year it was when this film was made yeah. certainly with all of those camps and people doing psychotherapy or or you know, right, primal that, scream type stuff. Yeah, and all seventy-nine. Of those kind of things, yeah, which is kind of weird and interesting. And the wood paneling on the wall—it's all terrifying. It's just scary. And the and hair of course, Oliver Reed is fantastic. Who always speaks very fast. You love oh, Oliver like, Reed. He's fantastic. So speaking of a film uh, of its time, in a way, uh, our next one is by Dario Argento, one of the horror masters of Italy. <laughs> and this one is Tenebre. Uh, hopefully I'm saying that wrong. I might be saying it wrong. Uh, it's 1982, um, and it is about an American writer who goes to Rome and is stalked by a serial killer who is replicating methods from his books, from the writer's books. And so uh, but when it first starts off, the police immediately, of course, go to him going, okay, what's going on? You know, these things are coming right out of your books. And he's, he's like, well, I don't know what's going on. And so they start investigating. So, you know, you think, okay, that's kind of a standard story. But this one has a lot of twists. It looks oh, very yeah. 1982. I just have to mention that Extremely since the score... The synth 80s. score, I have to mention synth score, yeah. like the, the band Goblin is also very much of its time. <laughs> yes. And, you know, it has almost kind of a look like a, a very polished TV show, even the sets. And one of the things I read <laughs> after we, I watched the movie is that Argento wanted, he didn't want to use anything that looked typically Rome. He didn't want any of the usual icons you see. He wanted it to look, to show like the modern parts of Rome, yeah. not the ancient parts, which is very interesting. The other thing um, that's very interesting about this movie, because we were just talking about the brood and maybe sort of the anti-woman aspects of that, this film... At first, I thought, okay, because Argento is known for, you know, slashing up women in his films. And this film kind of starts the same but way. But in a beautiful, but then, spectacular way. Yes, with the very big with splashes of red on their face. Beautiful, bright crimson blood. Yes. That's nowhere looks like real blood. It's, it's so paint, unrealistic. It's just, they're the It canvas. looks great. It looks <laughs> great. Yeah. But the thing is, is that the film then becomes a comment on itself in a way because the writer... Of the, the, the character is a writer of films, that, a writer of books that are slashers, and then people are accusing him, and there's a, character, a journalist character who says, do you feel that your books you know, are encouraging violence against women? So it's like Argento commenting on himself, commenting on mm. what's happening as the film, as it's yeah. unfolding, which is a very interesting that it's kind of commenting. At one point in time, I expected the Ewings and the, the Carringtons to go at one another because I felt like a Dallas uh, dynasty. Dynasty. Uh, the look of it looked very John like Waters 80s John Waters kind TV. of movie. You had John Saxton in there. Um, you know, it was an American actor who was, you know, goes across the way. We're going to see that again with later, a little bit later with Ron Perlman uh, going over to Europe to making it to, with, to work with an, an auteur. Um, and he is, our Dario Argento is a very interesting filmmaker. This, again, was right into the this, this stream where he did the phenomena. Uh, he did Inferno, uh, Opera, and, um, and this film. And then, of course, uh, there was, was Bird Suspiria, of the Crystal but that was way earlier. Plumage, right? yeah, that was a little bit before that. Oh, Bird so, of the Crystal Plumage, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But that was that was one of those first ones. But uh, yeah, he's a really uh, very interesting filmmaker. When you when you watch the one, you just kind of go, "What is this?" But then when you see them kind of all put together, you yeah. And this see one had some twists view. I was not expecting. It was surprising. We watched this one together, right? No, no, oh, I watched this I one of my own. I watched this one. Nope, together. nope. No, okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the twist was like, oh. 
Wow, look at that, a nice twist. Well, there's multiple like twists that. on top of twists. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And Carnival of Souls had a nice twist as well. I don't want to give some yeah, it's there. very like interesting. That. So, um, yeah, this was another one that really looks at time. He certainly always, you know, could always tell what era he was making his films because it really just has that time stamp of that look. Although I don't think his earlier ones seemed as dated as this one. Like this one, it started, I was like, whoa, this is so 80s. But yeah. I wouldn't say when I watched Suspiria for the first time, I felt that way as much. So I feel like some of his earlier films just felt like cool and weird. Whereas this one was weird, but I thought, oh, weird. And oh my gosh, look at that outfit and that hairdo and those shoulder <laughs> it's pads. It's a lot of white and chrome. Lots of shoulder that pads too, chrome we have but he's still, yeah. you know, the way the splatters of blood just perfectly, you know, just <laughs> the red. It's like it's like neon red yeah. on her face. It's just you know, it's kind of gory the way, that, but they're just so kind of sometimes they're so laughably fake. It's just I don't know. I wasn't it's scared, and I scare pretty easily, for what no, that's I worth. I was just surprised. Yeah, no, it was more like oh, that was not what I was expecting. So suspenseful, I would say for sure. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. So yeah. Uh, so we'll move on to our next film, which is Kronos. I did not write the year this was made. 93. Uh, 93. Got a one from every decade, Guillermo, pretty much. Oh, <laughs> no, did we? Uh, by Guillermo del Toro, Academy Award winning filmmaker, by the way. Uh, this is one of his earlier films. Um, this has a, oh, let's see, I wrote it down. An antique dealer runs across a 400-year-old scarab that grants eternal life. Also, a thirst for blood, blood. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, here's another person with these all these antiques surrounded by. He kind of has his own little life there with his grandson. And we kind of get a nice little establishment there. Now, with you know, Guillermo del Toro, you know, um, certainly this is one of his earlier films. So we, don't, we kind of see a little bit of what he he's able to do. It wasn't until, you know, after a couple of films that he kind of gets the budget that he really deserves to be able to create these Elaborate worlds, elaborate yeah. Worlds. You think it's something like Pan's Labyrinth. That sometimes, you know, I thought maybe because sometimes he got, because he, some of his films get a little too caught up in the look and then doesn't have enough character development in here. So I thought, well, maybe with this one we'll have a little bit more. Not necessarily. They it's never, still pretty much in the look. Yeah, yeah it's, but they never mentioned Vampire, which is pretty much what we kept saying was, those vampires, right? Because they, they never say that. They never say that. But they're out, were they out in the daytime? I don't know. They don't remember. have fangs. Yeah. No, they did, didn't they? I don't no, remember. I don't remember things. I did write down clocks and bugs. And the reason I wrote about that, because that, because here, this is his first film, his first feature. And I thought, oh, but we're watching it after we've seen a lot of his other films. So yeah. we're watching it not in the correct order, of course, not chronological order. I wouldn't say correct. But, um, and I thought, oh, here we already, because he uses that in other films as well. And especially yeah. those like scarabs and, you know, and these mm -hmm. fantastical elements that he has in something like Pan's Labyrinth or The Shape of Water, where you really see these, like, I, the, he creates these little worlds. And I think this, like, little antique story has really creates that world as well on a low budget sure. um, so which is which is neat and as soon as they brought it they have the item that they you know have in the antique store I can't help it I'm trained by gremlins and I thought oh no don't open it something bad's gonna happen if you open <laughs> if you open the antique looking well, box I'm thinking gremlins something bad's gonna happen not know they're in horror I know that but I thought that's don't open the box and then he opens it and I thought well that's not good and then yeah. the thing comes out and the bug comes out and I'm like, well, you know, that's not good. If something's <laughs> popping out and it's got a fang on it, don't maybe, maybe close it. But, you know, they never do. They don't listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, he always has, he has monsters as part of his world there. There's always people who are orphans or becoming orphans or they lose somebody in their life. Um, that, that's interesting. Cute little um, kids that are like, you know. A lot of kids, yeah, yeah, in his films there. So, you know, I like this one. I thought it was really interesting. And I remember this years and years ago when they had, uh, when he did Blade 2. Yes, he directed Blade 2. And it's good. And it's a Marvel movie. Uh, but uh, that's where they had the vampires that actually their mouths opened up even further and they would bite on the neck with these big, huge mouths. But they also kind of had this with the Cronus where they would latch on and it attaches itself and it just has this something with it that I remember Gene Siskel talking about saying he has a thing with it latching oh no it was Roger so they had latch onto it it's just he's got this weird thing because they need to mimic and so it was all like interesting. interesting yeah I hadn't really thought about that yeah. and uses actors Ron Perlman of course he went on to work with again in Hellboy, Hellboy and Federico Lupi who is the star of this film as well he worked with in quite a few other films so um, he likes working with some of the same actors repeatedly and having some of the same myths but it's still a great movie for fans of Del Toro he's definitely one 
that did not, um, what's the word, peak at his first film. I mean, you see the the promise here, but I would say this is, his later ones are much, much better than Kronos. So in a way, that's good, you know? Well, yeah, I think that once he got the he budget had. that he needed to well, kind and of also really just kind more of build, a vision world too. build to yeah. it, and I thought that was fine yeah. there. And then once you're able to do that, then you can bring in actors that can actually hold the screen, maybe work with a little less than other would, would be able to. Uh, I think lesser actors would be able to and, and be able to build something in their own. Well, he's working with Ron Perlman, Brian. Yeah. Well, yeah, but I'm just thinking because of the other ones. I always like Ron Perlman. Really yeah, cool. it's just, it's fun. It's just, um, you know, and also develop the story a little bit more, I think, because yeah. the story here is pretty thin. Well, he, you know, he's such a devoted grandfather and working with a store, but then once he gets his eternal life and really gets the taste for that and really starts to enjoy that at one point in time and towards the end where he's fighting, you know, to defend it, to keep it, he's actually endangering his grandchild. I thought that was kind of interesting that he was I able felt to like what that. it could have used is more set up at the beginning then because he just starts off and he's like this really great older man, but we don't see yeah. any thing where he's unhappy about being older or he's got aches and pains or there's anything that makes him decide to take this weird leap that he eventually takes so yeah. i thought they could have used more development at the front end i like the character that was collect that was trying to collect it and the, the uncle of ron perlman's character and i liked was it uncle yeah oh because he just he wanted the the, well he had, had motivation he knew what he was want, he knew what that was about and he knew what that was going to be able to grant him and i thought he was really fascinating and i liked his the warehouse there with all the plastic coverings, I thought that was right. a really good look there, and so you get to see. Yeah, yeah for a relatively low, but I don't know what this one was budgeted at. Um, oh, we don't talk about money on film snobs, really. He shot. Well, we talked about Carnival Soul shot for thirty-three thousand dollars. So that's you, what it's famous. You brought that up. I brought that up yeah. because well, it's a famous fact about the movie because, you know, it shows that you too, filmmakers, you can make a movie <laughs> on low budget, and someday Criterion Collection may pick it up. Even if you never make another uh, movie again, like her Carvey, right? So uh, I think that we, you know, we, we can recommend all of the movies. Yeah. Is that correct? Well, The Brood, no. I you don't you think like I can recommend. Okay. I don't think See, I'd want I want to watch it, it as again. A Cronenberg, I'm and a I liked Cronenberg some fan. of his earlier ones, but I just can't mm. get. I couldn't get into that one. Yeah. It wasn't scary enough, and it was. And some of the gore was just like, oh. And over the top gore can be fun, but in this case, I didn't find it fun. Oh. I did, and I didn't care about the characters. That was the other thing. Is I didn't care what happened to them. So I was like, okay, fine. That person's going, okay. You know, in a horror movie, you have to be somewhat invested in the characters if you're going to slash them up. So if you had to rank these, how would you do that? Oh, Quietin. Quietin is the best? Number one, easily. Carnival, next. Go uh, Japanese films, for sure. Um, yeah, then uh, Carnival of Souls, yeah. and then mm, Tenebre, mm. then Kronos, then The Brood. Okay. What's your I order? I can live with that. Oh, I would probably move The Brood up. Over Kronos. Okay, and but otherwise the, the same? Yeah, pretty much. I'd seen, We're same I've seen now uh, uh, The Brood a couple times now, actually. Oh, okay. Okay, so uh, we certainly want to thank you for watching the, the show. That's the wrap-up for there. Uh, we want you to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, listen to us on KMUZ, watch us on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe and also hit the bell to notify of new episodes. You can watch us on uh, CCTV, Salem and Corvallis. Thanks for watching, and have a great day. Oof. <laughs> Shit. Thank <laughs> you.